This is your emergency broadcast system. You are listening to the hashtag This with the Beer podcast. Business that you never heard before. Now, belt up and shut up. It's going to Welcome, friends, once again to the show where we speak our mind and never mind what we speak. This is the 49th episode of the business podcast that is authentic, shameless, unapologetic, and raw. This is the hashtag biz with the beard podcast, business as you've never heard before. I'm your host, the guy whose wingman is always on his face. I am the beard, Kurfi Smith. And as always, I wanted to give a sincere shout out to all of our listeners and now viewers. I'm very and truly appreciative of all your support that you have given me and to the show. Now, do me a favor. If you enjoy today's episode, please subscribe on one of the many platforms that are out there, such as Apple, Google, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, or whatever it is the heck you listen to, right? We're, we're on those. Then if you like the show or you get something out of today's show, especially, which I know you will, um, please give it a five-star uh, rating and then remind all your friends and connections on social media to listen and subscribe as well. Now, as you may have heard, I did say viewers, and that means hashtag biz with the beard podcast in its entirety is now on YouTube as well. So go out to our YouTube channel, subscribe there, give us a thumbs up, leave a comment, and then again, share it with all your friends. Now, I'm not going to jack around today. Well, at least at the beginning, because I have a guest who is joining me that I have been overly, overly excited now for a long time to have on the show. I have a man who is part of an exclusive and elite group that many of us can't even fathom being a part of, nor we can even be accepted into. He is part of a group of individuals that have trained, operated, sacrificed, and died in the shadows for many of us for, for many, many years. He is a Navy SEAL, and if you don't know what that means, let me explain the best that I can. He and his brotherhood believes in getting the job done at all costs and could care less about what you think of them. However, this man is not just another SEAL, as if that is even a saying, but for those of you who follow the limelight, you may remember the name of American hero Chris Kyle or the movie American Sniper. Our guest today trained Chris, and Chris was his personal student. Our guest has served our country as a U.S. Navy SEAL and is a decorated veteran of the global war on terror. As you can probably guess, he has been recognized as one of the premier sniper instructors in the U.S. military and has served as a master training specialist at the SEAL Sniper School in Cal uh, Coronado, California. I believe that's where it's at. Um, he is an expert of technical and physical surveillance and was part of an elite group hand-selected to perform intelligence collection in denied areas around the world. He has spent years developing, writing, executing curriculum for the SEALs team and is instrumental in significantly reducing the failure rate of Navy Special Warfare's internationally recognized sniper course. Since departing from the SEALs teams, he has worked on corporate performance, sales and leadership training, bringing an unprecedented amount of innovation, efficiency, and structure to the domain of business and personal performance. He is the author of Raising Men, Lessons Navy SEALs Learn from Their Training and Taught to Their Sons. He also has a free PDF book called Habits of Heroes that you might get at ericdavis215.com. So with that, I've kind of given it away. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with extreme honor to introduce to you Mr. Eric Davis. Eric, thank you for your service to this country and welcome to the hashtag Biz with the Beard podcast, sir. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, great. So Eric, again, thanks for coming on. And I know we've been trying to get you on the show for a long time. So I really appreciate you doing this. I know we started talking about was it last spring and then the Corona thing hit and the things kind of just went from a world, you know, world one for everybody. But again, I appreciate coming on. Um, with that, I want to get right into the show because I think your life experience is quite intriguing. And the fact that you are part of a group of individuals who life and others' lives, my life, depend on you performing at a level uh, a, a potential that many of us cannot even imagine. And if you don't, people will suffer, die, or you'll die. So tell me why the Navy SEALs for you, what made you want to go this route? 
Oh yeah. That's a potentially deep question, but I'll give you, I'll go middle, I'll go medium deep and then we can decide where to go yeah. from there. Hey. Yeah, so how the story goes when I was about 15 years old, uh, my dad, who's like this six foot plus captain of our county sheriff department, bishop of our church, he was like my everything. All I ever wanted to do was be a sheriff. I just want to be just like my dad. Okay. And about 15 years old, um, how the story kind of unfolds is I walked downstairs and there my mom and dad were. And, and basically my mom goes, your dad needs to go to the hospital. My dad broke down into tears and he goes, I need to go to the hospital to get better now. And what had happened is my dad um, had, it was ultimately diagnosed with clinical depression and a few other things. So he just uh, kind of crumbled right there in front of me over wow. the span of a few years. And I was too young to be without a father, but I was just old enough to know that I still needed one. Like right. I knew that I needed that. So I had an older brother. Um, he kind of guided me into some different personal development books. And back then it was audio tapes. And, you know, so I was like, okay, I need to fill this gap. So I went after it like somebody who's, you know, scared and needed to perform or figure life out would, would do. And I realized that most of that stuff didn't work. Like, it's not that there wasn't good information. It was just kind of like not really designed to impact my life. It was just designed to really kind of market to me and have me think my life was going to be impacted. Right. So I found myself scared alone without a dad. So I just did what was, I thought was obvious to anyone. I thought, well, I'll go become a Navy SEAL and there I'll get training <laughs> There, I'll get guidance. I'll learn masculinity. I'll learn what a man is. I'll become a man and all of that stuff. Um, and that's what led me into the SEAL teams. And then that's where the story starts and led me ultimately to becoming a sniper instructor, then intelligence operative. And then we can un unpack that one, then the applicability yeah. to the life, the business and everything like that from there. Abs absolutely. So, and that's, and that's probably really tough. I mean, you're, you're fit, you said you're 15 year old. 15 years old when this happened with your father, right? And yeah. So you yeah. were just, you know, and how long did he go away for? I mean, was it for, you know, several years or is it just, he never was the same after that? And that's just what affected you or. Yeah, never the same. So um, ultimately he was in and out of treatment. They were doing like, that was back in the day. They were doing like electric shock therapy at a gnarly level um, cooking brains. So the therapy made things worse. Oh yeah. Um, then some of his health deteriorated, then ultimately ended up in a nursing home. And he was in a nursing home, which is, uh, that's a really tough one to go see your dad there. And he was in a nursing yeah. home for how to be, I'd have to ask my older brother, but there's a lot of it. I, I don't want to say I tuned it out, but it just a lot of, I just don't replay it often. Yeah. Um, uh, but at least a couple decades, um, for sure. He just died two years ago and oh, well, yeah, man. I mean, I graduated field training in 97, 98, and he wasn't able to make it cause he was in a nursing home at that point. He'd already oh, been wow. in nursing for a chunk of time. So we're talking a long time. Yeah, no, I, I started, you know, about the loss and whatever. And I, you know, and I get that. And I think a lot of us get it as young boys and you just had experience at a much earlier on and is that you, your father fit are everything to you. And my father was put in a nursing home, you know, several years ago, still young, he was in his sixties, but again, he had some issues and, um, you know, watching him in his sixties when he's supposed to be retiring, retiring, enjoying life. There's this, you know, father figure of mine who was, you know, a war hero, a, you know, a farmer, just, you know, a hard nosed guy. And, uh, it, it just, you know, in that state, it's just, it's devastating because that's your hero. That's, he's not, he's, he, he can take on anything and all of a sudden now he can't, that's, you know, like you said, that's really, really tough. So, you know, my condolences to you and your family and um, yeah, that's, that's tough. So, but let me ask you when you, with the Navy SEALs, <laughs> what do you think it was going to be like? And what was it actually like? Oh, <laughs> So I'll speak from the context of training or, you know, being a trainee, because that's really what, you know, when you want to be a SEAL, you really, you know, any special operations, you're really thinking about, I want to go through the training. I, can I make it? Yeah. And yeah, so I was going to go into the army and I was going to be an airborne ranger kind of deal and a medic there. That was my, I was already enlisted there. And then the movie Navy SEALs came out in the nineties, which is almost embarrassing, but it's the one with Charlie Sheen in it. And um, and I didn't know that there was special forces in the ocean. I didn't know. And I grew up right. a surfer. So I was like, whoa, I got to go check this out. I had no, no interest in joining the Navy. But then I, I saw that. And then I saw their video. And me and my buddy were going in together. Like we're doing that. There's some sort of, I forget the name of the program, but you get to go to boot camp with your, your best friend. And that's what we were going to do. We both saw the video. And he goes, whoa, dude, that looks too hard. And <laughs> 
you know, but I'm like, I'm running scared, right? Like, no, I need the hardest thing. And now yeah. looking back, I can see like, okay, it is a manhood. There's some manhood thing. There's like, I had to, I had to do the hardest thing to prove myself. I had to convert from the, the redhead freckle face kid whose dad was sick to a badass. So I'm like, right. okay, I got to do the hardest thing. Cause all I was doing was preparing myself to go into law enforcement. Like all I was like, okay, I need the most amount of training, highest level of training. And, you know, now the movies, they, th those started to become my heroes, uh, which there's nothing wrong with that, actually, if you do it right. But, you know, I was like, that's what I wanted to be like, because they're, they're right. kind of, they pulled up next to my dad and said, hey, we're here, too. And thank God for those things like, you know, like Lethal Weapon, yeah. and all those old school movies. Thank God for those guys. Save yeah. Me. yeah, absolutely. So so question, did your uh, friend, did he survive it, too? Or no, did he bail or? No. Um, yeah, he, he had, he got tripped up on the ASVAB test, you know, which is just kind of an aptitude test, which he, you know, you could get training and, and, and go from there, but I just don't think his heart was in it. So he ended up in the <laughs> Navy on a ship. Um, and then he ended up going over back over to the army and then became very incredibly successful. So yeah, yeah that just wasn't, he wasn't, that wasn't his thing. But you, but you're gung ho, man. You're going. So, uh, what was the hardest moment? I mean, what what, what was the most extreme, or uh, the breaking point? Or were there several breaking points in your training that you know you're like, man, I don't know if I can do this. Or was it was that or was that that moment at all? Yeah. Uh, so not a lot of people know this about me. I actually have a YouTube video. I don't have many YouTube videos, but I have a YouTube video where I talk about this in an interview. So I've actually been to SEAL training, quit, got out of the Navy, and then came back to SEAL training and, and made it. So we might need to really? We don't might need to, So I have to declare that because what I'm going to say next is SEAL training wasn't that hard for me. Um, one, I'd already been a Marine Reconnaissance Corpsman, um, went through their school. So I'd already been through special operations training. I've already been exposed to cold water. I've already been exposed to all kinds of levels of greatness, you know, from working with um, so tightly with the Marines. Um, but there's something I didn't realize, and it's something I teach on my webinars and, and I actually teach as part of my coursework is it, it just happened to be because I was a surfer, I had become habituated to what they call the psychological state of flow. And most people refer to that as being in the zone. There's all kinds of ways you can refer right, to it, right. kind of where you mentally check out. Um, so when things get difficult or hard, because I was already doing Dawn Patrol, getting in cold water. That is just what I did. And I was surfing and, you know, I just, that was my normal way of being. So I would just check out. So it was never like, oh my gosh, this is so cold and hard. I'm going to quit now. I, I did almost fail SEAL training and that's a different story. <laughs> but <laughs> as far as the traditional thoughts of quitting or anything like that, I was in good shape, um, except for when I was talked into quitting um, the first time I was there. So you were talked into quitting. Why were you, why were you talked into quitting? Yeah. So I already had two kids um, live in Southern California and, you know, cost of living is that's as high as it gets. Uh, right? yep, I mean, yeah. Manhattan, Manhattan and San Francisco might be able to beat it, but I don't, I'm South Orange County though, too. So, I mean, it's, I got, it's a close race. Um, you know, my brother, successful entrepreneur, and he was just talking to me and, you know, he's like, Hey, I, you know, gave me the old, I, I make more in taxes than you make in a year kind of thing in the, in the spirit of love. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. You got kids. You want to be home for your kids. Um, and then it's actually very impact. I, I think a very useful story. So I was like, you're right. I quit. I remember some guy almost like one of my fellow students almost punched me in my face. Cause like we were having a good time. Like we hadn't even got to hell week yet. It's just not hard. You know, right. like, I was built for this stuff. Um, and anyways, I got out and long story, super short is I was uh, doing the old bouncy house at my, one of my nephew's uh, birthdays, my nephew's, you know, young, quite a bit younger than me. And, uh, <laughs> I literally remember the bouncy house falling over and I landed in dog crap on the, in the grass. Cause I fell off <laughs> and I was like, Oh my gosh, I got out. I was hit. And I, so I had to go back in the house. And then my, my nephew's best friend goes, mom, look, that's Eric. He was almost a Navy seal. Oh, and it was like a shot across the bow. And then all I, so my kids are just a little bit younger than my nephew. Like now I'm, I'm looking at kids and family and it was right in that moment. I'm like, the first thing I'm doing to teach my kids is to give up on my dream. Yeah. And that's when I realized like, there's no amount of time I will be gone. That's going to make up for that. Yeah. Um, so that's, and then I came back, I came back in for the second time, which is extraordinary because my, I couldn't pass color vision tests. So twice I had to commit to the Navy with being told, no, you cannot go to SEAL training. And twice I got to SEAL training. 
Because you couldn't pass color vision tests? I mean, I pass color vision test. Yeah. I'm wow. a little bit red, green deficient. So, huh. uh, the great, I just, I said, I, I'm a big throw my hat over the wall. So I coach, I coach men right now, I'm making career pivots all the time. And that's guys are trapped for all their life. And then we talk and we yeah. they got the opportunity and they're just afraid to throw the hat over the wall, which the analogy goes, once you throw the hat over the wall, you've got no choice, but to go and get it. Um, yeah. Otherwise it's gone. So, well, I'm, I'll, I'm going to pivot a little bit here because I know I do know that you do a lot and we're going to kind of get into some, you know, we're going to get into the three strategies. But before that, I, I know some things that are kind of important to you. And, you know, and being a I never served in the military, but my father and grandparents both served this country during wartime. Um, and I hear stories of like the sacrifice my parents and you know, my mom and grandparents made during those times, especially, you know, during war. Right. And I know the word sacrifice is important to you because I've heard you say it several times and, you know, some things I've watched and, and you speak of the sacrifice military families made or do make. Um, and I also believe personally that we now live in a world of instant gratification that we as a society do not understand the actual, you know, what actual sacrifice is and that maybe it makes much makes it much more difficult for veterans nowadays because it, it's just different. Can you expand on that by sharing your thoughts about the sacrifice you have made and what it was like for you to come back to like civilian life? And is it different now than it was, you think, because of our instant gratification? Yeah. So I'm going to come at sacrifice a little bit different than most people and probably differently than, than expected. So when I think about sacrifice, this is what I get from guys. Like uh, you see it all the time. Well, I'm just going to burn in. I'm going to work my butt off. I'm going to just, I'm going to make a bunch of money so I can take care of my family, pay the bills, produce the roof. Like they're just paycheck machines. That's what mm -hmm. they do. Um, and that kind of worked a little bit with our fathers and our grandfathers. And I, I have a tremendous amount of respect and love for, you know, that generation, but that, 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 definition and style of manhood is, is antiquated and, and does not work anymore because we live in a much more competitive and dynamic environment. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't just show our kids that to work hard, which, which is actually, that's a whole nother thing I can go into. So just working hard <laughs> all day, that ain't going to get it done. We got to be creative. We, we got, there's a, we got to be inside a relationship. We got to be We got to be pulled up closer to our family, other relationships. We need tribes around us. We can't do this alone anymore. So when I talk about sacrifice, I talk about strategic sacrifice. So one of the things I teach people is to identify all of the parts, which actually impact their ability to, to live a good life. So they're really clear on the part. It's a kind of a funny thing, right? Everybody wants to live a happy, good, successful life, but nobody could actually tell me what the parts of life are. But if you're exactly working, Oh, right. Yeah. If you're working on a car, you can name it as if that's going to impact who cares yeah. unless you're a mechanic. You know what I'm saying? But I'm just like the things guys know about. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. Man? Tell me the parts of life like you got it. That's, you know, and I'll go into masculinity there. You're so, so right. I mean, you're exactly right. Because I just actually had this conversation several times recently. Someone said, well, you know, Kirk, I want to be more stable. And, you know, well, I want to make sure my kids have a good life. I said, well, what does that mean? What, I mean, what does that look like? you know, what, what, when you say stable, what's the number? What, I mean, what, you know, what, 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 you know, what is in your mind? But to me, that's always, I want, 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 or I need, but I don't know what that need is. Is that, was that what you're kind of talking about or? Oh yeah. They have, I mean, just, I mean, tell me the, you know, every part of your life that actually impacts your ability to live a good life. And I, I, I don't like, I don't try to call people out, but like, just tell me the parts of life. They can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, no wonder, no wonder you're not mastering life. And when we don't, when we haven't identified something it tends to master us rather and we become its slave. When, once we have identified it, now we can master it. Right? Exactly. Because and then that scares people though, I think, right? Because someone says, well, I want this or I need this, but you don't know what that really means until you sit down and put it down. And I used to be this way. And until recently, last several years, I've wrote it down. It's okay. This is what I want. This is what, it, you know, whatever that number is or whatever that item is. And now here's what I have to do to get that. And you look at that and you're like, wow, it's not what I thought. <laughs> you know, it might be harder or it might be a longer road and it's really difficult. And I think going back to what you said, it's where people just getting back to this life as well. I just need to work hard and I'm just going to do my nine to five, just keep working hard. And that's just, it's, it's not reality anymore. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't hold anything against marketers. I mean, I have to market for my business. We all yeah. have to market my business but what that's fueling the fire so and this can get really deep but they're they're really only marketing to one definition of manhood one definition of masculinity which is that mm -hmm. popular hammer hitting whatever you want to call it yep um, but the problem is that 
people aren't able to identify who they are themselves. Um, and then, so they got this one single offer. They're trying to be it because everybody's talking about it and it doesn't work for them. Um, but in coming back to strategic sacrifice, uh, the idea here is that if you're tracking these parts that actually impact your ability to live a good life, then you can let some of them hang. Right? Like it's okay if I'm working my butt off for a while and not being super present with my kids so that I can make double my income and work half the amount of time moving forward for the rest of my life. But it's not okay for me to do that to the point where my kids start checking out and they start letting um, social media and you name, you list off the things, raise them instead of me. Like yep. I don't mind a babysitter, right? Yep. But it, but we're not going to replace dad. We're not going to replace mom. We're not going to replace anything like that. So when I say sacrifice, strategic sacrifice, like, yeah, you can do it. Because I see men get stuck there. They prioritize by importance rather than power. So like, oh, my family's number one. I'm like, ah, family might be number three right now, dude. You having fun, you getting your health out back in order and then actually starting to make enough money where you can actually live a good life now. And later on when you can no longer work, those might be one, two, and three. And then guess what? Now family, you'll just be able to crush it. But like yep. you might have to miss a thing or two for a while. And it's easy for me to say because I went away for nine months out of a year. I've gone to war zones. So I know how to strategically sacrifice so that the yeah. overall good is improved. Well, it's almost, oh, absolutely. It's like the saying I always, you know, it's when I kind of adopted lately and I hear from another coach that I follow is, uh, you know, the, the term the king eats first. Not everybody, you know, you've got to figure you out before you can figure everybody else out. Right. Yeah. Well, what do you get? What's a, what's a parent, what's a father going to lead his kid to if all he knows how to do is work and get out of shape and be miserable yep. at his job? Like, okay, great. So you're going to teach your kid how to work, get out of shape and be miserable at their job too. And then here we go. And then now we got a whole nother group of angry, inauthentic men yep. acting like pricks to their spouses or yep. just, or repl using beer and alcohol instead of engaging with their kids and everything like that. And these are the things that we need discipline or mental toughness for. We just need a reconstruction of our environment and we need to live on fire. And when we're living on fire, guess what? We show up for others on fire because our cup is full, yep. not because we're selfish, but we're being altruistic by caring for ourselves first. Like you said, King eats first. And, and, and I like I like that. I have to unpack that some more, but I like it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, well, you know, and, and, and the kid, you're like, the kids do watch you. Right. And, and, and it can be, and it's so easy to let like the video games, stuff like that, babysit them. And I just quick little story here. My son's starting football back up in the spring. Um, it's something he really likes to do. And, you know, he watches me, I lift and I work out every night and now he's at the age he's 10 and he goes, I was coming down the stairs. I'm going to go, I'm going to go hit the gym. He was playing Fortnite. He goes, Oh, you're going to go work out dad. I said, yeah. He goes, well, can I come with you? I got football season coming up. I said, yeah, we can do this. Come on. Let's you know jump on. And it's nothing I made him do, but he's watched me do it. Right. And he mm -hmm. sees me and he sees, you know, dad's in good shape. He's not, like you said, out fat, overweight. He's, you know, uh, you know, he's what I you know want to be. And, or, or be like and here he just jumps on and he's working out with me and the cool thing is my little daughter she comes in there and she's you know much younger but she's she's now joining us now it's like our after work or after school activity instead of you know doing you know video games stuff like that we're in the gym and we're having fun and you know it's 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 entertaining for me and you know and actually it drives me to, because they want to do it now i don't like skip out on it as well so yeah it's pretty yeah. cool yeah <laughs> And if we take it one step further too, it's like they're, they're watching what you do, right? And they're going to copy mm -hmm. that. But I think what's even deeper and mo most important is maybe that's not going to be their thing. Yeah. But, but maybe what is there, what they are watching too, is like, you know what? Dad likes to work out for God knows what reasons, but dad's doing <laughs> that because that's who dad is. Yeah. And so it's also who we're being like, man, it's, imagine that if what we taught our kids, this was a jump from my book until I, I've just been studying. I never stopped studying, but imagine that. It's not about their performance, quote unquote. It's like, well, if there's their authentic self, if we put a little graph and like, well, what if what we did is our kid lived 100% who they were, who they were created to be? Yeah. Like, it's a, it's a mind blower when you think about it. It's like, yeah, it that is. whether they're lifting weights or getting good grades or going to Harvard or whatever, it's like, well, scratch all that. Like how, who could get their kid to the most authentic spot? Like that's a life. Cause that's how they, who they were created to be. So amazing. Yeah, and you're right. And I, I totally agree. Cause I just actually had this conversation with my older ch children. Right. And they're very, they're gifted athletically. And I have one daughter and I've mentioned her on the show before. She's, you know, she's beginning scholarship offers and, you know, to play soccer and, and track. And she's just a junior, but she's been getting for the last couple of years. 
but I've always had the conversation. I just want to, I said, I want to make sure you're happy, you know, and you know, where you want to go to school. I said, yeah, I would love for you to come down to school here in the Southeast, but Harper, if you wanted to tell me you wanted to go to school in Arizona and you need to do that, that you need to live your life, not because dad can come see you, you know, yeah, I want to see you, but that's, don't pick a school because of me. I want you to pick where your life, where you want to be. And I've told my other kids like that, you know, Hey, you live your life. We're, I mean, we have, there's only thing one, one certain is one certain thing in life is none of us are getting out of here alive. So I don't want you to live my life. I don't want you to live society's life. I want you to make smart ethical decisions and tap into your potential. And, and that's it. And, you know, that's a happy life to me. So, you yeah. know, Got on my little soapbox there. So, <laughs> yeah, get it. Oh, God. You need get it. We all need yeah. to hear it. I need to hear it over and over again, too. We just don't, we don't swim in that world. So, we got to back yeah. it. Up. Yeah. We, yeah, for sure. Well, I, I want to jump forward to what you're doing now. We kind of touched on it, you know, several things. And the first thing I want to talk about is the corporate training and live webinars you do centered around the three strategies you discovered as a Navy SEAL sniper that uh, people live a life, as you say, of purpose and passion, right? And those, the, the three states strategy are the mastery, flow states, and try, right? Did I get yep. those right? Okay. Yep. And as me, we live in a world of distraction because we're so distracted, you know, we're, I, you know, we're more confused than ever. Describe to me this mastery because I'm really, I, 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 I'm going to get excited about what you're going to talk about. So you're going to have to tell me to shut up. How do, <laughs> how do we accomplish mastery in today's world? Okay. I got you. So at the core what we're going to do is we're going to stop giving up. We're going to stop sacrificing or burning up power, which I, de which I describe as deployable levels of time, money, energy, and creativity. My claim being, if you had unlimited amount of time, money, energy, and creativity, is there anything you could not get done? So power, right? Mm -hmm. That's typically why guys aren't doing what they need to be doing. They're lacking there. And what we do is we get life done. We go to work. We go to the grocery store. We do our more. We do whatever we do, and we burn those things up. But there's a way to actually start getting those things handled in a way that produces, you can't produce time, but produces more deployable levels of time, money, energy, and creativity. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like some deep, I mean, you could sit under a tree and smoke whatever your favorite thing is to smoke <laughs> and really think through that thing. Now, now that's kind of like high level, right? Then we start getting pragmatic. So here's how you master something, become an expert at becoming an expert. So as a SEAL sniper instructor, Right. What I understood was it wasn't necessarily the big things that people already understood that was happening to them that was stopping them from performing. It was the things they didn't know they didn't know. And here's the, the, the thing that was especially true. There are small things that will alter the path of a bullet. Right. So at about 500 yards, shooting starts to feel magical to someone because what happens is the spin of the bullet will start to impact it. The temperature, the where you're at on the planet and the spin of the earth, like all of these things. And here's the thing. Each one of those things, probably not enough to move you off target. And that's the problem. So what we do as men or anybody in any situation, any performance is we'll discount things like, oh, that's not that big of a deal. But what happens is these things actually clump together and they start synergizing in a way because mm -hmm. nothing is like uh, cords in your backpack or cords don't ever untangle themselves and set themselves up. They always get tangled and you know what I mean? They go into yep, chaos. Yep. Right. So that's what anything does that we're not monitoring, that we're not observing. So that's where this whole philosophy of mastery came from. And then it's like, okay, so when you go to take a long shot, you have to identify everything that impacts your ability to hit the bullet. So same thing in life, I already mentioned it. So it goes identify, assess, prioritize, execute, and evolve. Like that's the formula for mastery, which I'll walk you down real quick. So what impacts your ability to live a good life? And then once you understand those parts, you break it down. Well, what's the impact of that thing? Soul, mind, body, friends, family, fitness. Like we can, like some of the stuff obvious, but what's not obvious is to track it and care for it. So then we need to know the parts of the thing. And then we need to understand the practices that we need to be in to care for or create that situation, right? So if we're yeah. talking about body, how it, it doesn't matter. Do we need to even deal with our body right now? Or is it, is it life or death? And if it's not life or death, it doesn't get on your counter. That's why people don't follow through. It's not because of 30 days to do a habit. It's not because of any of that. It's like, it doesn't matter to that, them. Enough. Yeah. It's not important. We have so many people want to learn a language when they don't make any money. People want six pack abs when they're not have enough money in retirement. It's like, they know their subconscious is like, dude, it's not really that important. We don't need to do it. So that's identify. Then we need to assess like, well, what's the current state of this thing? And what's the future state of this thing? Should we continue in the same practices as we're in? And that's where people miss. Because 
if something like our money or our health or relationship with our kids or you name it, no tribe, no fun, we could, you know what I mean? We could be like, well, what's, what's that going to look like in the future? But as soon as we're like, oh, that's a bad future, we're going to kind of center ourselves with some sort of a story. Like, well, that's because I'm busy. You know what I mean? We're going to start yeah. making a story, right? Yeah. So we need to use real, sir. I mean, I, I won't go too deep. I'm going to try to keep this high level. No, you're fine. We got plenty of time. <laughs> What you end up with is I use a, a mind map, but it's set up in a very specific way. This requires a very specific approach. It's not a very hard approach. It's not a difficult approach, but it's like, you got to get the formula right in the right order for this all work. So I'll use a mind map for this. So now you can just picture like, okay, there's all the parts of my life. I have like a dashboard, right? It's like flying an airplane or a car. You know what I mean? We do something simple yeah. like flying a car. We don't fly a car without a gas gauge and a speedometer. It's ridiculous, but we try to fly life or drive a car, excuse me. But we try to drive life without any gauges. It's incredibly yep. ridiculous when you start thinking about it this way. So we prioritize by power, not importance. And I already talked about that a little bit. Most guys fall into the trap. Like my family's number one, my family's number one. Like, yeah, what if... What if number one was something called performance health? What have we got you sleeping? What have we got you dieting? What have we got you exercising? Instead of showing up at 60%, you're bringing this raggedy old 60% body to the fight every day. What if we got you up to 85, 90%? And what if you took all that energy and moved it into your career? Do you think you would make some more money in, in less time? And everyone's like, oh, of course I would. Like, fantastic. Now you know where the time and money is for your family. That's prioritizing by power. What's going to ripple across those other parts of the life and what's going to produce that early return on time, money, energy, and creativity. Remember I was talking about that. Yeah. So now we're going to get it done in a way that produces more power, doesn't deplete it. So that's, we get that done prioritizing by power. So everyone out there that's like, why is this guy accomplishing this, writing a book, producing this business? You know what I mean? You do it on podcast intro. Yep. I hear a podcast intro and I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing with my life? But the, <laughs> the reason is that they're prioritizing by power. They're moving in a way where they're building power. They're not moving in a way where they're just giving it away. Exactly. It, you got, yeah. Then it comes down to execution. Now, two things about execution. When we identify, assess, prioritize, we start, we're going to now start putting things on our calendar, right? And there's yeah. different tactics. I'll just say there's a way to use a calendar very powerfully. And I'll coach guys and like, oh, I got it on my calendar, but I'm not doing it. I'm like, okay, well, let's talk about this. Does, what's the impact of this thing? And if it doesn't come down to life or death, get it off your calendar. Because if you do this drill, I guarantee everybody, you're going to come down to about five, six things you could do. There's about five, six things you can handle, like relationships, money, or like work, working out, right. event, you know what I mean? It, it ain't that much. And, but you also realize you have about 15 things you need to handle, but there's a way to clump these things together and get them all done at once. So when we execute, we, we only execute on that which impacts our ability to live a good life and lead others to do the same. Nothing else gets on there. And that's the problem. People have so much superfluous BS on their calendar the because yep. God, you, there's so many reasons why, right? Um, GoPro, but there's so many great reasons why to want to do everything. It's beautiful, but we can't get lost in that infinite. So yeah. when you live that way, inside of execution also comes evolution, right? So experience is not inherently valuable. People are experienced being racist. People drive cars. They don't get any better at it. People go to work every single day. They don't make any more money. They just keep up with inflation and you don't get better at life just by living it. Yeah. Right. So we need to evolve it. So this was the big impact. One of the big impacts in sniper cells, I started keeping little standard operating procedures for training. And every time I went to train one particular thing, I'd stop, start, modify, stop, start, modify, modify. I continuously evolve this thing. I think the book's called Good to Great and what, how they describe it. It's not about revolution. It's about evolution. So you put it out there and you just tweak it. And that is the secrets to super, super high levels of performance. We just need iteration and a feedback loop. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've touched on so much right there that I'm like, they're trying my mind, trying to grasp it all. One is when you were talking about mastery, how trying to master all the little things, I, I guess with like we, we did the example of the bullet flying through the air, right? There's so many little things that can affect that the further, you know, the further away you are. Right. And so it's really trying to understand that. And that's why we don't, you know, accomplish or master a lot of things because we don't understand all those little things that, that affect the outcome. Correct. Is 
and, and, and then, I mean, and then you get into the, the calendar thing. And I used to, man, I, I used to have a bad habit, you know, just because I've been project management and stuff like that. I have a lot of tasks and I have all these tasks and prioritize them. And I've just kept looking at these tasks and there nothing's getting done. Right. But I'm working and I'm working. And I'm like, there's so much crap out here. I got to get rid of this. I don't, I mean, it's just junk. And like you said, I've narrowed it down to, okay, what's the highest priority? I dump the cat, the tasks, put them on my counter and said, this hour, this is what I'm doing today. And that's, that's it. Help me with that. Am I do? am I going in the right direction? Am I going in the wrong direction? Yeah. So it's not about getting things done, although we do need to correct. Get done, right. All due respect, David Allen. Absolutely. We do need to get things done. Not about projects either. So it's about processes. It's about highly repeatable processes. And this is where when when I do talk about three hour or three day work weeks or like cap performance through process, you're building a process and there's a different mindset too. So if I go to, I don't answer, I don't reply to emails, right? I'm fulfilling on requests. I am building part of my, I'm building my processes. And those processes where the power comes from. So if you're getting things done, you're just burning up time and energy to get things yep. done. But if you're if you're bolting a wheel onto a car, you're producing a process that's going to get you somewhere faster. And here's what guys do. I love this analogy. So they're like, oh, I've been taking the bus to work. The problem is I'm on the bus's schedule. I don't have any autonomy, so I can't work out when I need to. I'm at the disposal of the bus's schedule. I'm at the disposal of the, the work schedule, victim, victim, victim. I'm going to buy a bike. I saw this guy, he's riding a bike and he can now go to and from work whenever he wants. And then he buys the bike, builds half of the bike and it's looking good. Then boom, oh, I'm going to buy that bike. That bike looks better. Buys the second bike, Mm -hmm. builds half of it. He's now spent 100% of the time it requires to put a bike together and has no additional capacity. That's a guy getting things done. That's a guy subjected to shiny object. That's a guy operating outside of strategy and not by mastery. Things are happening to him rather than him producing things. Absolutely. Sense. Absolutely. And yeah. And, and getting into that, you know, I know I do a lot of business consulting and I, and the biggest failure I see is businesses, especially small businesses do not document. They don't document the processes. It's left up to, you know, Fred or Joe or Karen, and they've been doing this job for five years. And then guess what? Karen gets fed up one day and she leaves and the company suffers. Everybody suffers. The owner doesn't get anywhere. Now he's actually gone backwards, right? He's trying to figure this out. And, you know, as we go through this and we go through a lot of these businesses, man, you guys have to, you know, we have to document this, right? And then once you document it, it's improving on that and keep improving on that, right? We always, we're always going to have to improve. Um, But yeah, that's, you know, that's a big failure, I think, in businesses because we don't document and we don't create a process. We just get the job done because that's what we think is most important at the time. Correct. And that's how you burn up power to get something done. Yeah. Think about this. If you're, if you and I were going to build a dog house and we just talked about a dog house today, we're like, how big is it? What do we want to do? What color do we want? What kind of materials are we going to use? And we talk about it right yeah. now. We'd be like, man, we're busy. We don't have time to actually blueprint this thing or write it down. So then next week we talk about it again. Is that thing going to evolve? No. And, and won't it actually go backwards? Because now you're going to show up with what you remember. I'm going to show up with what I remember. Are those two mm-hmm. things the same? No, no. no. All right, great. So no. now we're going, to t- we're going to take a few steps backwards. And then what goes with stop, start, modify? The next thing comes manage and maintain. So it's when you create processes for power, then you can start outsourcing these things. So like my grocery shopping, right? My grocery shopping, I create a process for it. It's a flow check. I can just walk around in about two minutes. I can just check, uncheck the boxes. Everything's set up. It gets sent off to someone. Somebody orders it. It gets stacked up by twos. So I don't even have to do an inventory. Anytime I see something that's, there's just one of it. I know we need to buy another one, but it's a process that I can now outsource. And it's those tiny wins. So a thousand cuts will kill us. Well, guess out, guess what? A thousand scars will make us stronger. Yeah, but yes. we got to put a process to it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's get into. I mean, we could be forever. This could be a two-hour show, but I can just I can roll really it. Go for 12 <laughs> I, I know, right? <laughs> hey, I'll just I'll just have to have you back. That's all we're gonna have to do. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I really went now. Let's get into flow states, right? As a Navy SEAL, what does this mean, and how does it cross over to civilian and our normal lives? Okay, so flow states do a few things. So there's some impacts, right? So they 
you'll end up more tenacious because when you're in flow, you're in the zone. So we do this five and a half nautical mile swim. Somebody will have to do the math, but I know it's like six, seven miles. It's something long for okay. one swim in the ocean. And there are some weird currents and some wind when I did mine. So I think it was like a six and a half hour swim. Oh, wow. um, it, it just ended up being oddly long too for our class. Now, most people are in that situation for like six and a half hours and that would be torturous and they, you would want to quit and leave. But by the time guys make it to that, they've already been through hell week. See, one of the things I think SEAL training misses and why there's so much failure is they're not testing for flow state aptitude. Because for me, my memory of that swim, I remember like 10 minutes of it. The other part of it was sometimes it was seven-year-old Eric playing outside or it was whatever was in my brain. I was just flowing. Just flowing. So, yeah, when we're in a float, we're not worried about time. It's when we, it's video games. That's why video games are a very powerful tool for kids have done right. We, we, we just, we don't care if we fail. We just go over and over again. We don't even care if we eat. We don't care if we sleep. That's a flow state. And one of the things about flow states is they make activities more enjoyable, which has a stick with them. We over index and in discipline and mental toughness. That's the thing about being a SEAL. Everybody wants that. I'm like, that's a tiny piece of the performance formula. It's important like a tire. It's got to be there, but that's not, it's not the biggest piece by any means. Right. So flow states make things more enjoyable. And what they do is they convert stressors and challenges like your son on a video game into something that's exhilarating and that pulls you in. So imagine living life. If the things that would stress you out and challenge you that were pushing you away from doing the very things you need to be doing to crush life. What if those things were pulling you in? What if it was like something you're like, Oh, I can't wait to slip into that flow state because it's so damn enjoyable. And it also elevates our level of perspective tenacity and creativity and then it loops backwards and forwards then you can go back to mastery and you've heard this before like hey step away from your paper come away from a problem so i like you could teach the science of flow state there's cool books out there but i could just prove it to someone so like what are the activities you love like me mountain biking surfing climbing running right. anything like that and everybody thinks those are the rewards for doing valued work and they are not. We've just been so conditioned to chase the carrot because that's what schools teach us. They teach us to do hard things so we get good grades, not really to no. make us performers so that they can thin the herd because there's only so many seats in the classroom at college, right? That's what they're yep. doing, right? So they just want to get the top, right? So they, it's easy to sell. I can go into that one, right? Yep. Yeah. So what if we just, for when I do the webinar, I'm like, just snatch that mother, snatch the carrot, eat it. Now I'll use that fuel to run faster, further. So we do those activities before our valued work. They are not the rewards. They are the cause of valued okay. work and then like now that. they move towards tribes so now if yeah so you, let's talk about tribes then right yeah it's quite you know they go together yeah yeah so a tribe is well hold on let me let me take it from flow just because i'm i'm flowing this way too so flow is going to accelerate our ability to master things right we're going to be right. more creative be more tenacious we're going to look at things differently and then for us to step into flow, like if your if your son your son was playing the video games, is he a video game guy? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. if that wasn't his thing, right, he wouldn't do it. Like, so it's the flow state that's pulling him in. So one of the things flow state does, because if you understand the impacts of flow, and you're like, whoa, I am checked out mentally. I'm just going. I'm going through this thing. I'm not thinking about food or anything. I'm not thinking about how long I'm doing this. Like I am fully engaged. Well, guess what? You done found yourself an authentic activity that is aligned with your breed. Like my Belgian Malinois, which is like a SEAL team dog. Like I don't have to, I can hold out a tug toy. I, like those little puppies, they'll just bite you right out of the, right out of the gate. Right. But like, she loves that activity. So we know that is an authentic activity for her breed. Does that make sense? Yep, what I'm saying? Absolutely. You makes learn sense. who you are as an authentic self. And then guess what? You go to try building, which is you go to try building. You're now bringing your authentic self and you want to talk about attracting people. Try showing up as an authentic human being. You'll be one of a thousand there and people can smell it. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. But now a tribe though is very different than drinking buddies. This ain't hanging out at the barbecue mm -hmm. or the soccer field or anything like that. I'm not saying those aren't great friends and I've done life with those people too, but a tribe is a group of mutually held is a group of three or more people. And I have to say three, cause you and your spouse, that doesn't count as a tribe. That's you and your spouse. Correct. So I say three now mutually held feelings of love, respect, and possessiveness right? Tribes are typically, typically built in life or death situations. So it, if you're not up to something big, you're not going to be producing a tribe. Yeah. So a tribe is going to protect and accelerate the current and future situation of each member of that tribe. This is very different than buddies. This is different than a camping trip. This is different than all that. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I'm talking about a group of people that you only not only do life with, but you couldn't do life without. You cannot compete in this current environment. And I'm not talking about from COVID. I'm talking about from the time the internet was like, you, things have been moving fast. Now yes. they're going to be moving faster. The only thing COVID did is this woke people up to the change. Yeah. It, it, it was just like, hey, this has been going on the whole time. This is just one little slap. You just hit a, we've been on the dirt road for a while. We just hit a bump and you finally realize you're off the highway. Yeah. So tribes are incredibly important and there's very specific ways to, to build them and to, to nurture them and to progress them forward. But I'll stop right there on tribe. But you have to be that authentic self. You have to have something to invite them to. So if you have your authentic flow activities, now you got something to invite people to. And the other thing I will say about tribe, and I'll pause right there. You got to have, a, you got to be connected to a con continuous source of human beings coming in. It can't be a pond. It has to be a river because if you just are condensed to your environment of which you live, right? Which that's what a tribe is. It automates and accelerates your, your, it's an environment. It's a human living environment. It automates and accelerates your success, right? But if you're just stuck in your neighborhood, right? Then you're mm -hmm. going to force other people around you into your exciting life, right? Which they'll agree to for a while, but if it's not them, they're going to check yeah. out. Yeah, and then absolutely. what happens next? If your mom, your mom, our mom taught us like, Hey, if all your friends jumped off a cliff, would you do too? Would you do it also? The answer is absolutely. <laughs> yes, mom. If I hang out with them long enough, I'm going to jump over the cliff yeah. or off the cliff. So I'll pause there on tribe. Obviously. I, no. Yeah. And I think tribe tribes a good one. And there's other, I really like to kind of go into this because, you know, I, I personally went through something about six, seven years ago, about seven years ago. And like you, you had mentioned, you used the term drinking buddies and I came to realize I didn't have a good tribe around me. Uh, and when I was going through this, I was all of a sudden alone. And then I came out of it, you know, you know, survived it, whatever. And then, you know, some of those people started coming back. And this one particular individual, so I just really miss hanging out with you. And I kind of looked at it and I said, you know what? <laughs> You're a great guy. And those times were fun, but I don't need drinking buddies in my life. I, I need someone who's going to be, be there for me and the good and the bad, not just in, you know, because, Hey, what are you doing tonight? Let's go out and have a couple of drinks and have a good couple of good laughs and talk, you know, maybe do something funny. That's, you know, I can get anybody to do that. I want a different life. I want to elevate. And um, like you said, I can realize I wasn't being my true self and that's difficult to do. And I think it's difficult to surround yourself with the people because I think a lot of people sometimes look at who they're around and say, okay, if I'm going to be authentic, I've got to cut some, some of these people loose. And some of those people, I mean, what if they're family members? I mean, I mean what's your thought on that? Yeah. So people have this idea that to be part of an elite group, right? Like, okay, I need some brothers or it could be brothers and sisters too, but I need, I need to be in a tribe that is accelerating and protecting my current situation as well as my future situation. Like, right. There, there's a pretty clear. Yeah. Cool. And then people are like, well, what about the people that drag me down or um, are toxic and everything like that? So the first thing I'd say, there's no such a thing. Those are just people being people. If you're the one dragging yourself that you're putting the meaning behind all that. Okay. Um, that's not quite how that works, but tribes are powerful. So, and what that means is we don't have to chop people loose. So I belong to a tribe because I have family members and friends who need help and they can't contribute to my life in any way whatsoever. So I'm saying, oh, I'm not strong enough to really be there for him. Like I feel I should be in our, or, and, or I want to be, and God has commanded me to be, by the way, if you have that kind of belief system, right. I'm not strong enough on myself. That's why a search and rescue team is a team. So, like, okay, I got to be part of a powerful group. So I have the power, time, money, energy. I see what you're saying. Yeah. See what I'm saying? It's not about excluding people. This is about including more people. This is about saving human life. Like we're thinking tribe. See what you're thinking is tribe. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with it so that I can get my life handled. But if we get life, our, our life handled and died, who cares? We might as well not have been on the planet. Yeah. There's a whole thousands of people out there that are hurting and they need us. So yeah, tribe, we don't lose anyone. We gain. So, yeah. I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. It makes a lot Power. of sense. Yeah. Yeah. You're Love it. it's normal, right? Oh, I'm yeah. going to lose time on energy and creativity. If I help this person, like, Nope, we're going to do it in a way where we produce time on energy and creativity. Great. I love that. Love that. See, I learned something every day. Appreciate it. Man. <laughs> Give me another 10 hours. I'll pull one more. <laughs> well, we're, 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 we're going to keep talking. <laughs> what, <laughs> um, so uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, you're Chris Kyle's instructor, right? 
what yeah. make what made Chris the best, and what in your mind does it take to be the best? So, um, I get boy, I'm sure that could be a big, big, big old one. For me, what I noticed about Chris, I can remember him coming back to Sniper Cell, kind of debriefing and talking, and I'm like, awesome, dude, get out, write a book. Like, that was amazing. But then he went back again. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So he just kept going back, you know? Yeah. (laughs) He just kept showing up. And, uh, you know, when that's oversimplified, if you think about it, but it's the guy, it's the people who just keep showing up if everybody wants to be somebody or be something but it's like oh well they went to work dragged ass home and drank beers with their buddies yeah it's like that's not that's not what people are doing when you start unpacking what people are doing like they're living eating and breathing purpose right and yeah doing it in a way in a way that it's not like oh i gotta live my purpose but i have a family it's i i gotta live my purpose and i have a family right it's a yes and kind of situation i would say that's it uh, and that was my perspective. That was the number one thing I saw as he kept going back. That's why you get called a legend. Yeah. Wow. So what was it? What was he really like? I mean, you know, some, is, is the movie portray it right? Not, I mean, it's Hollywood. I know. You know. <laughs> yeah. I thought Bradley Cooper did an amazing job. I, I literally thought I was just watching Chris most of the really? time. Yeah. So that's what he, that's what he looked and sounded like for me. Anyways, I'm like, wow. I mean, I hadn't seen him in a few years when I saw the movie, but I was like, that looked, sounded like Chris to me. Uh, he was a redneck. He's just like what you'd think. <laughs> redneck, redneck Texan type, type guy yeah. through and through. Same with Marcus Luttrell. I'm like, and Marcus, Marcus Morgan Luttrell, his brother. I'm like, you guys, you guys are some rednecks, man. Cause I grew up in <laughs> the area. I grew up a surfer. I'm like, I don't know what you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. Totally yeah. So I don't think the real, anyone met the real one either one of those guys they'd be disappointed at all well you know and the and the you know and and i'll wrap up on 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 this is you know and i kind of want to talk about it because i think you have a great maybe have a great insight on this is is around chris's death i mean here's a guy who was what wanted by iran iraq or i don't i can't remember but had a huge bounty on his head right and for him to come home and the tragedy around his death, you know, you know, at the hands of another military individual who is suffering, obviously, uh, from maybe PSD, you know, stuff like that. What, what in your mind can we learn from that? And, you know, what have you learned from that experience? Oh. What, what should we, what should we take away from it? Yeah. So what this is going to do is, push me into veteran, veteran suicide, veteran PTSD. Yeah. And all like some people are going to love me after I say what I'm about to say and some will hate me. Here's the thing. So I, I went on, I go on the news when some idiot kids go shoot something, you know, eat, shoot something up or, you know, with Chris right. Kyle, and they ask me this question. And so one of the things I'll say is like, for sure, the guy's life probably wasn't going super well for him or her right? Like they, they probably weren't living their best life. They probably weren't right. living a good life. Yep. And oh boy, how do I unpack this? So here's the thing. So the military is kind of like a socialistic thing. You're getting paid no matter what. Being an entrepreneur is much more scary, much more dangerous, is much more stressful than being in a war zone to me. I can fail a mission and I still get paid. My family still gets medical. I can still pay the rent or the mortgage, everything like that. As an entrepreneur or inside a competitive marketplace, that can end real quick. As an entrepreneur, it can end two weeks ago. And I just found out today because the bank account's gone or inside of a, a business, it can end in two weeks when they give me my two week notice. So one of the things I think what's happening to vets is they're in the military. Now they got enough money to go buy some clothes. They got enough money for rent, uh, maybe even get married and a dog. And then they're like, oh, I'm going to get out of the military. A CEO taught me this community is capacity. So they had capacity because they were inside of that community. So I think what happens is they get out and then you hear all these stories about them trying to transition and all this, oh, my PT, PT, everything like that. I'm like, well, no, you had a job. They trained, they trained you. They paid you while they were training you. You quit that job. And now what you learned is you might not be qualified to live the same lifestyle that you'd been accustomed Mm. to because you were part of a massive community that was caring for you. Right. Now, this can get sketchy. I'm not saying guys don't have mental health issues. I'm not saying there aren't real things like that. But even with mental health issues, again, 
if we've got power, time, money, energy, and yep. creativity, they're usually not these things that have us in destructive behaviors. They're actually these things that provide us an opportunity to identify and use them as a source of strength rather than a source of weakness. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm getting fatigued by the disabled vet narrative. And it's not, I'm a dis, I'm technically, I'm disabled vet. I, you know, I have a disability assigned to me and everything like that. I, my concern is that we're using it as a reason not to live out our full life. Like we're, we're putting right. our own labels on ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully that doesn't throw too many people. I swear I'm a nice no, guy. No, no, you are a nice guy. No, no. Hey, <laughs> I was say, what, 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 my, my, Hey, you can say what you want to say on here. That's what it, you know, yeah. people know that. So don't know. And I don't judge at all. And I, I agree with you 100%. So, you know, I, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, I, I, we are coming up on an hour here, believe it or not. And this is, uh, it's unfortunate because I want to keep talking, but um, I will definitely have to have you back. Um, before I sign off, I, I, I know you have a book called Raising Men. Can you talk about the book and why did you write it? And, you know, what, what's it about? Yeah. So raising men, you know, if I were to say anything, it's, it's, it's just as much about us identifying the gaps that our fathers left us, which all of father, that's what the, all of them do. Mm -hmm. You know I mean? That's, that's nothing wrong with that either. Like, okay, great. They did what they did. Now what's left for me to finish. So it's as much about that as anything. Um, there's a big chapter lead from the front where I talk about be the example, like live the example, let show them how to live a good, inspired, authentic life. Now I don't have as much authenticity language in the book because I've grown since I've written it. Um, but I would encourage someone to use that chapter, um, for that. And then, you know, take the principles out of there. I get a lot of good feedback from men and women, a lot of single moms, um, read it too. It's just a starting point with some foundational, I would argue truths you know, some yeah. foundational elements of raising anybody. Um, and hopefully for people, it's a place where you can start. Uh, if it did nothing else, but showed somebody, wow, I can go and study something and improve my performance as a parent or perform or improve my performance as anything. Right. That to me is a huge win. So that's my hope that it's a seed for that. Great. Well, I look, for, I have not read it yet, but I will read it. I promise you. I'm, I, I, uh, I, I was looking through it and after going through and looking through your, your information and watching some of your videos and, uh, yeah, I'm very intrigued and being a father of five, um, three from a previous marriage, two from, uh, my new marriage. Um, yeah, I'm excited to read this, this book. Is nice. there, is, is there anything else you want to plug before we get out of here? Uh, I, I know there's a thing, a thing you call the three-day work week that you're doing like a free webinar right now, or do you want to, you know, talk about that a little bit before we jump out of here or anything else you want to throw out? Yeah, I think it's still right on my homepage of, it, you know, the old www.ericdavis2and5.com, but you can, people can register for the webinar. It's about an hour. It's free. Um, and I'll take them through that whole mastery. I'll take them through mastery flow and tribe. And then at the end, I'll show the coursework, how we do it. I make a, a, an offer for people to join us at a, I, only from that webinar, like a, a oddly reduced rate, because I like to, re, uh, the people that show up on the webinars, like to me, this is a mission, right? So if I can train someone how to live a good life and then teach them the structures and strategies and everything like that, so they can lead others to do the same, that's how we're going to cure all the masculinity issues, right? If everyone's living a yeah. good life, we're going to be, we're going to, we'll stop violence, right? Like when you yep. think about terrorists, it's like, they're just trying to get the same things we are, our, their house, they want to take care of our family. They're just doing it wrong. Yeah. So this thing is very, very mission-based. And, and I like working with people who can show up. So awesome. yeah, and it's free. Can you re repeat the website one more time? Uh, yeah, it's the old, you know, www. <laughs> Eric Davis. 215 the digits 215.com perfect perfect get out there sign up for that guys um it'll definitely definitely be worth it eric my man thank you for coming on the show today and thank you for sharing with us your life your experience and knowledge um i feel like like you said we could talk for 10 hours and hopefully again i i want to have you back so maybe we can do that in another six months or something like that have you back on the show and we can maybe dive in a little bit you know deeper on some of these specific topics if that's all right with you yeah absolutely my all pleasure right. And again, I'm extremely appreciative for your service. And I want to thank you for the sacrifice you and others have made and continue to make for not just our way of life, but for many people all over the world. And you're, you know, you're an inspiration and a hero, my man. So thank you. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having right. me on too. I appreciate it. It's an honor. Right. 
There you, there you have it, friends. My good friend, Navy SEAL, Mr. Eric Davis. God bless and thank you for coming on the show, man. You got it. Thank you. Right. Well, I want to remind everyone to subscribe to the show on your favorite platform and leave a five-star review if you've enjoyed the show today, which you're stupid if you have it. Um, <laughs> this is an amazing show. As always, I'm grateful for all of our listeners who tune in all over the world. I also want to remind everyone that you can pick up the scent of hashtag biz with the beard podcast um, and other uh, hashtag biz with the beard products and gear on our website at acsexec.com. And that's it. Another show's in the books, but never fear. The beard will always be here until next episode. Same beard time, same beard channels. Thank you for listening to hashtag biz with the beard. Have a successful day.